I love that I get the opportunity to be the bearer of good news this morning. Okay, because sometimes um, when you're, when you're going to invite someone to like a new restaurant or a movie and you don't know about it, you're a little bit nervous, like, are, are my guests going to enjoy this? But then when you're going to a place that you know the people are going to love that you're inviting, it's a good feeling, right? Well, I get to have that good feeling right now because we have a very special guest with us this morning, a guest speaker, and uh, I'm going to introduce him in just a moment. His name is Reggie Dabbs. And he is a world-renowned speaker, travels around, speaks to millions of youths every year. And we have him here today. We are so blessed, so honored to have him here. I actually heard him speak when I was 14 years old, and he's only about 10 years older than me. He spoke at a youth camp in Alexandria, Minnesota, changed my life. And uh, I'm so excited that he's here today because I know what he has to say is going to change your life. So join with me, River Valley Church, and give a very warm welcome to Reggie Dabbs. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Are you good? Good to be at church? Now, there's a couple of things you have to understand before I start. Number one, I'm different. I love being different. I don't want to be normal. Normal is boring. Number two, I'd like to thank you for an entertaining Monday night, thanks to your Minnesota Vikings. That was the craziest football game I've ever watched in my life. And y'all, 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 that's just crazy. And, and I know being Minnesota fans, you're playing Detroit today, so if you're going to lose, let's just go on. Now. Third, uh, I just want you to know I'm different. I don't like normal. I think normal is boring. So today, uh, I just want to let you know, number four, I'm black. <laughs> and I was brought here today to teach everybody how to be black. So this is entitled Chocolate Sunday, all right? <laughs> hey. Yeah, by the way, everybody's chocolate. Everybody's chocolate. You might be dark chocolate, milk chocolate, or white chocolate, but all chocolate's good, y'all. So now in chocolate church, since we're having chocolate church, number one thing you got to do in chocolate church is you got to talk back to the preacher. Everybody say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's say this. Say, all right. All right. Say that again. Go, all right. All right. Now this time I want you to run those two words together. Grunt when you say it and go, I eat. You're talking black now. Yeah. <laughs> we're progressing along well. <laughs> Number two, you got to note this, that if the preacher, especially black preacher, if he gets up and speaks and he don't sweat, kick him out of your church. <laughs> but he ain't doing his job. I will sweat because I'm a black preacher. <laughs> Number that last but not least, you must have a good time. You can pretend you ain't, but you know you are. <laughs> so let's have black church today, all right? Now, I grew up in church. I did. I grew up in church. I grew up in church. This is what it was. Sunday, you went to church. Because when I was a kid, we had rules. Kids today... They ain't got rules. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Back when I was a kid, you did wrong, you could die. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Man, I can't believe it. Now that I watched a kid storm out of the room and slam his door. I would never do that. Because if I did, my mama would be, she'd pull a Chuck Norris on my door, you know what I mean? <laughs> she'd come in and, like, you know... So here it is. Rules at our house. Saturday, do what you want. Have a good time. Play with your friends. But on Sunday, everybody going to church. And if you ain't ready when mama's ready, you're going like you look. Y'all help me with that one. Everybody say, you're going like you look. Now, I was young, all right? I was like six, seven years old. My brother, he was 12. Now, when you're 12, you the man. Y'all remember what it's like to be 12? You dress cool, you act cool, you got cool friends. You the man. You got one hair on your chest and you brush it every morning. You the man. But at night, you still a boy. So during the day you're a man, at night you wear Batman pajamas. My brother was 12 and he had Batman pajamas, dog. This is, it was a onesie, you know what I'm talking about? Little booties on the bottom, had a yellow belt with a bat and a cape and little ears on the top. It was unbelievable. I'll never forget the morning. My dad came, my daddy, big, bald-headed, got a vein right here pop up and down when he get mad. He look like a Klingon from Star Trek, all right? It's Sunday morning. My dad comes rolling up in the room and goes, boys, get up, let's go. Mom's almost ready, let's go. So I get out of bed. My brother, a.k.a. Batman, he looks at me and he goes like this. I ain't going. I'm 12. I do what I want. And he rolled over and went back to sleep. Now, people... I'm here to tell you, that 
was the greatest Sunday of my life, all right? That's the only reason I'm sharing. It ain't got nothing to do with my sermon, but I just every Sunday I wake up, I'm like, Batman. <laughs> Dude, my brother was gone. I got dressed. I started singing to myself, oh, happy day. Oh. I looked up. My dad comes in and goes, let's go. She's in the car. And he looked over, and there my brother, Batman, sleeping. And my dad looked at me. The veins started popping. I'm like, oh, this is good. And he says, what is this? And I said, he said, he said he 12, and he said he do what he want, and he said ain't no bald-headed black man going to tell him what to do. That way he said, okay, now wait, y'all. I wasn't saved, so it was all good, all right? My dad looked at me and said, get in the car. And I watched my dad do something so smooth. My daddy's smooth. He just scooped down, picked up my brother, and looked at me and said, we're going to church. And if you ain't ready when mama's ready, you're going like you look. <laughs> he laid my brother in the back seat of the car. We're going to church, and my brother looked like Batman. It was the greatest day of my life, y'all. We got halfway down the street, and all of a sudden, my brother woke up, looked out the window, looked down, saw the bat flying. He's like, no! He's looking at me like, help! I'm looking at him going, na 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 Batman. <laughs> it's the greatest day of my life. We just get to church. We're in the parking lot. Dad goes, let's go. And my brother's crying, snot flying everywhere. He's like, no. And my dad goes, you be ready next time? My brother's like, yeah. And he reached underneath the seat, and he pulled out clothes. <laughs> Worst Sunday of my life. We had one more rule. In our house, it was simple. If mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. And I was the youngest. One day, my dad came home, and my, my mama's like, oh, happy. He said, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I said, what's up? And my dad looks at me, and he's like, he just mouthed, I'm sorry. And my mom goes, I've been waiting for this. I wanted one of my babies to play saxophone, and it's you. <laughs> I look at my dad, and he's like. <laughs> so mama made me play saxophone. And I brought it. So I'm going to play you a song. Don't get too happy. You haven't heard me play yet. Um, <laughs> I like this song. This song says, if you don't know the words to say and you can't find the words to pray, say the name of Jesus. He's always there. He'll always take care of you. I hope you like my song. I'm ready. Here we go.
Thank you, thank you. Yeah, mama knows. Because I wanted to play the tuba. Could you imagine that one note with a tuba? Brother could die. <laughs> Sixth grade. Some of you are looking at me like, oh, dude, he's funny. Some of you are going. The Bible says a merry heart do it good like a medicine. Let the medicine flow. <laughs> I was thinking, did you know men and women are different? Men watch ESPN, women watch Oprah. That's a little different. Even down to the movie thing. Now go with me on this. Trust me, I'm going somewhere. I was thinking the other day, there's this uh, network, uh, TV network called the USA Network. You know what I'm talking about? Did you know not too long ago they had men weekend? In other words, they showed three movies, one on Friday, one on Saturday, one on Sunday. And they showed those movies over and over and over again. And they made money. How? I don't know. Well, they got me. I like that movie. On Friday, no, no, Man Weekend. I mean, that's just what you hear. Man Weekend. That just makes you want to go. <laughs> man Weekend. <laughs> All the guys in the room. I'm going to say Man Weekend. You just two times just bark. Go. <laughs> Ready? Man Weekend. Oh, that feels good. Let's just do it one more time. Man weekend. Oh, that's good. So now let me do this. Because I, I was off that weekend, so I was at home, and I made my wife enjoy Men Weekend on USA Network. So I'm going to tell you the movie. If you like the movie, just kind of go, give me two barks, all right? On Friday, they showed this movie eight times. It was a movie called Remember the Titans. Ooh, I heard women. There were some puppies in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I watched it three times. That was a good movie. Then on Saturday, they came out with that movie, Gladiator. Woo. Good movie. Men movies. Oh, yeah. Oh. Then on Sunday, they topped men movie, you know, with a movie called Braveheart. Woo. Wow. But like all great networks, they spoiled it. Because one of the commercials on Sunday, they said, Join us next weekend for Women Madness. <laughs> and my wife goes, Ooh, you're home. We're going to watch it. <laughs> Brothers, listen to me. There are some things you just can't get out of. And so the next weekend was the longest weekend of my life. Because on Friday, they started with a movie called Sleepless in Seattle. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't ask. I did not ask for your help, okay? <laughs> you know why them people were sleepless in Seattle? Because they didn't have that movie to watch. <laughs> Saturday, they came out with a one-word movie. If it's ever a one-word movie, it ain't good. It was called Notebook. <laughs> why are you clapping? I didn't, I didn't ask. Notebook. Anything referring to school shouldn't be watched. <laughs> Got my brother on the second row. He's like, hey, man, that's good. <laughs> then on Sunday, they hit rock bottom on this one. <laughs> Titanic. <laughs> no. <laughs> that was not about a piece of jewelry. What is up with that? It's about people drowning. I can't believe they did that. You th that j I, so I was thinking, if I made a movie, I could pull men and women together because I know what brothers want and I know what sisters want. And I could make it work. And today at River Valley Church, I decided to unveil my movie. Hey. You today. Why are you looking at the screen, bro? No, I ain't that rich. <laughs> He's like, get some popcorn. It's on. <laughs> now, I'm going to make it happen, but not like that. i got to be creative here. Now, here it is. Like, like my wife. My wife could be doing the dishes. My son could be chasing the dog. The dog barking. I'm just doing whatever, making noise. And all of a sudden, my wife could have one ear on the TV. And it'll be a trailer for a movie coming out. And it'll be one note of the background music. And she'd go, stop. And my dog's like, boo. And my son's like, boo. And I'm like, Jesus, help us all. And she'll look at the TV and go, hmm, that's good. And I'm like, how did you hear that? So I got to do something cool to capture the women. Men, we're easy. Let's just be honest. All I got to do is blow stuff up and say somebody's going to die. <laughs> and we're there. But ladies, oh, how complicated can you be? So they told me that you have the greatest sound guys in the world here at the church. 
So I need to ask him to help me out. So here we go, man. I need somebody to capture the women up in here today. So just lay it down for me. So my movie goes something like this. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago. That was good, wasn't it? There was a man and there was a woman. Their love was deep, their love was strong. Nothing on, below, or above this earth could ever separate their love. That was good, too. All the girls like, ooh, but I'm losing the guy. He's all right. Nothing on, below, or above this earth could ever separate their love. But someone will die. I got the brothers back. That's good. He realized he had married the perfect woman when after the honeymoon and they were back home and it was time to go to work, he stretched early that morning and when he realized she was gone from the bed, there was an aroma that caught every bit of his senses and he breathed in and went, whoa, bacon, biscuits and gravy. He told all the guys at work and they told him it won't last. But that day, before he even got to the front door, the smell hit through the door and he smelled like pot roast and homemade bread and mashed potatoes. <laughs> he opened the door and the table was set and the candles were lit and she was there and she's like, welcome home. And he knows that she's the best. Somebody say every day. Oh, I can't hear you, chocolate people. Say every day. It was like that every day. The candles, the table, she was there. It was on. They were in love. One day when he came home, he opened the door and the smell of the food and he looked at the table, but something shocked him because instead of two play settings, there was three. And he said, honey, what's up? What is, who's coming to dinner? She said, clean up and I'll tell you. So he cleaned up, he came and he sat down and she said, read the card. So he grabbed the card and opened it and the card said, we're having a baby but someone will die. I was losing the young guy in the back over there, all right? Even though she had morning sickness, even though she had this stuff going on, she still made time to make it happen. The candles would be lit, the table was set. It was unbelievable. One day when he came home, it was unbelievable even more because there was another setting. He didn't wait this time, he grabbed a card. It was another kid, two boys. Even though she had two boys running all over the house, at five o'clock, the candles were lit. The boys were in their high chair. And it was unbelievably beautiful. It was great. You couldn't ask for a more perfect family. You couldn't ask for a more perfect love. Every day, the candles were lit and the table was set. One afternoon, she knew it was almost time. She cleaned the boys up. The food was prepared. She lit the candles. She set the tables. The boys were in their high chair. And at 5 o'clock, she looked down and realized it wasn't 5. It was 10 after 5. He had never been late. Years, and he's never been late boys got restless so she fed them and she put them to bed and as she began to wonder that early afternoon became late afternoon and became late at night became early in the morning right before the sun was to rise the next morning there was a knock on the door and two men stood there one stood and wept while the other spoke and said I'm sorry your husband he's gone I'll be honest, I've lost a mom and lost a dad. I've buried brothers, I've buried them. And I've spoken at their funeral and saw their lifeless body standing as laying in front of me. But I never knew what it was like to lose my wife. Uh, she's been sick, but I've never watched her like almost die. And I cannot imagine that pain. I cannot imagine what that would be like. So this woman, what did she do? She threw all of her love into her boys. These boys had it made. They were unbelievable. These boys reminded her of her husband. They looked like him. They dressed like him. They walked like him. They smelled like him. And that ain't necessarily a good thing, all right? But she would make, make sure they had it perfect. She would make their sandwiches at lunch and make it perfect. She would peel the crust off the edges. She would slice the sandwich diagonal. Look at me. If your mama don't cut your sandwich diagonal, she don't love you. Oh, my bad, dog. But Jesus will cut it diagonal. He loves you. The boys grew up and they fell in love. They got married, but they decided they got to take care of mama. So when they built their home, they built an apartment connecting the two. She taught her daughter-in-laws how to cook, how to make meals. Every now and then they would all have dinner together. It was one of those nights and the table was set and the candles were lit. And her mama sat with her two daughter-in-laws waiting for her boys to come home. And they never came home. 
Both boys died that day. Before you get mad and kick me out of the church, I didn't write this. All I did in my own special way was quote to you, Ruth chapter 1. Sometimes you got to make the Bible come to life for you. But there's something about this that you got to understand today. In the few moments that I'm with you, there was a woman named Naomi. She's the mom. Ruth was one of the daughter-in-laws, and there was another daughter-in-law by the name of Oprah. Naomi told her both daughter-in-laws, go back to your home, go back to your home. But Ruth would not leave her side. Oprah did. She went back to Chicago and started a TV show, and it's really <laughs> successful today. <laughs> Just making sure you're listening to me. What's crazy about this is what she said. Naomi, in chapter 1, verse number 8, she looks at Ruth and her, her other's daughter-in-law, and she says this. She said, may God show you kindness that you have shown the dead in me. I don't understand that. You see, Naomi knew God. Naomi knew what God can do. Naomi knew the love of God. She was a part of this kingdom of God. But yet and still, she said, may God show you kindness that you have shown the dead in me. Why would she put herself among the dead? She's not dead. She's still living. What are they saying? Are they saying that even if you love God, something can go so wrong in this world to can make you think like you don't want to be here anymore? Are they saying that something can go so wrong that you can say what she said in verse 12? In Ruth chapter 1 verse 12, Naomi says this. She said, even if I thought there was still hope for me. Even if I thought there was still hope for me. They say that I'm the best speaker in public schools. I speak to two and a half million kids every year face to face. I've been on every continent in the globe. I've even been to Antarctica. It's cold. How cold? I almost turned white. That's how cold it was, all right? <laughs> I woke up one day and I heard myself say, get her done. I'm like, I got to get out of here. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. <laughs> I love, I love speaking in schools. Tomorrow we'll be in schools. Tuesday we'll be in schools. Wednesday we're coming to Minneapolis. We're doing what they call alternative school. It's the last chance. Every kid that's been kicked out of every other high school go to the D's. We're doing four of them that on Wednesday. I can't wait to get there. There's a company in Minnesota that runs everything that I do in Minnesota. Their job is to be with every kid in the state of Minnesota every four years. To hear hope. To hear faith. To hear that you can make it. To never do it. And that's what I do. They're called Youth Alive. You help Youth Alive. You sponsor Youth Alive. And my friend Richard Baker is here, and i got to give honor where honor is due. All the thousands upon thousands of kids that I speak in Minnesota is because he works and sets up those programs. Would you thank my friend Richard Baker? He's right back there for what he does in getting us in public schools. He does a great job. But you got to listen to me. There is no other place other than public schools where you find hopelessness. You can't blame kids for what they do. Everybody looks at me and goes, why does a kid do drunk? Why does a kid get drunk? Why does the kids do that? Why is he? Do you know there are young people who've been hurt so bad that they'll take sharp and dull things and just cut themselves? And even in the hottest day, they'll have long sleeves on. Do you know that there was a girl in a high school that came up to me after I'd done speaking, and she had on a sweater with a hood on it, and the hood was up, and I couldn't see her eyes. All I could see is little blonde hair sticking out. And she hugged me and whispered in my ear, thanks for coming to my school. And when she went to pull away, the sleeve on her sweater went too high, and I could see the scars on her arm. It was like she had been beat up by a cat or something, the scrapes and the scars. She had to be only 15. Some of the scars looked like they'd been there since she was six. And when I saw her scars, I'm crazy. Y'all know that? Have you figured it out yet? Any brother that can take Naomi and do that is a crazy man. And then to do it in public is really crazy. But when I saw her scars on her arm, I couldn't let her go. I took my free hand and I started rubbing her scars. And all I could hear myself saying was, no, baby, don't do this. Please don't do this. Getting to weep, so I pulled her in so no one could see her cry. I had to let her go. Four years ago, some college students said, we're going to start a MySpace about you. I said, a what? They said, a MySpace. I said, MySpace? They said, yes. Ooh, that's a lot of space. <laughs> I don't know it was a computer thing. Quit laughing at me, lady. <laughs> she wrote me on MySpace. During her assembly program that day, I wrote a poem when I was 16 in high school. I had to wrote two. Because I'm not a poet. Look at me. I don't know if I play football. <laughs> so my first poem I ever wrote was like this. I like football. Yes, I do. I like football. How about you? <laughs> Teacher didn't like that one. <laughs> she looked at me and said, make it from your heart. I said, all right. So I wrote one. I never forgot it. And it simply said, I don't need to know your name to know your pain. I have my own. I don't 
don't need to know your home to know your shame. I have my own. But somebody loved me just the way I was. And somebody loves you just the way you are. When she wrote me, she said, Dear Dad, that's what she called me. She said, You did not know my name, but you saw my shame. You did not know my home, but you saw my pain. She said, And you love me anyway. I'll never forget you. There's a version, a different version of the Bible. It's just written a little different. It's called the message. And what Ruth says in those two verses is unbelievable. And instead of saying, uh, instead, instead of saying, may God show you kindness that you've shown the dead in me. And instead of saying, if I thought, if I thought there was still hope for me. Do you know what she said? She said this to her two daughter-in-laws. This is unbelievable. She said, I've been given a pill too hard to swallow. I've been dealt a severe blow. Wow. You see, you got to understand, and this is where I turned black, all right, because you weren't there when Jesus found me. You weren't there when he's wrapped his arm around me. If you could just speed up the clock 24 hours, and whatever school I'm in tomorrow, if you could be there, it would go something like this. Dude, I know I'm funny. I know I'll make you laugh, but i got to tell you the truth. I don't belong here. I don't belong speaking to you. I shouldn't be on this stage. I shouldn't be on this gym floor because I don't. Because something happened to me. I was in the second grade and it was a parent-teacher conference and everything was fine until I realized my parents were old and my friend's parents were young. So in the car going home, I yelled to the front seat, hey, why y'all old? <laughs> don't ever do that. Don't ever do that, all right? <laughs> when we got home, my mom was crying and she said, you can't change your past, but you can not change your future. They showed me my birth, you know, my birth certificate where it said orphan property of the state of Tennessee. I grew up in foster care. They told me my story that my mom slept with a man for $20 to get food for the kids that she already had. And I'm nothing but a $20 bill. But Jesus found me. I was dealt a severe blow. I was given a pill too hard to swallow. It took a long time, but then I put all my love and all my hope in my foster care parents, and they died. Dealt a severe blow. I was given a pill too hard to swallow. But what's yours? What's yours? If you can't find hope here, where are you going to go? If you can't find help here, where are you going to run? Where are you going to run? Everything's going to be all right. We got Jesus. But you got to let him help you. You got to let him hold you. You got to get over not giving up. You got to get over there's no hope for me. You got to get over I've been dealt a severe blow. You got to get over I've been given a pill too hard to swallow. And you got to say, okay, no weapon formed against me will prosper. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. And you are. No, you're listening to a $20 bill. What were you doing at 3 o'clock this morning? Did you have to slide out of bed so your spouse couldn't hear you? Did you turn and face the other way and just cry? Were you staring at your sleeping children thinking, what are we going to do? Give it to Jesus. You know what I am? Today, right now, for River Valley Church, you know what I am? I'm the biggest, blackest Hallmark card you've ever seen from heaven. Because, man, every now and then you get that card and it just gives you hope, you know? You get that card and it just makes you go, dude, I'm loved. You get that card and you just get this feeling like, maybe I can make it. You can. But why don't you let somebody help you today? Let Jesus hold you. Hey, dads, I need to talk to you because you messed my sleep last night. I woke up early this morning, and all I could think of was dad, 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 father's dad. So I thought it was me. So I texted my son. He's like, I'm fine, man. Why you wake me up? So like, no, 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 I'm all right. And I text my wife, and she goes, why would you wake both of us up? I'm like, he told you? Yeah, he just told me you texted him, and you called me. I said, oh, my bad. I love you. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye. And I started praying for you. I want to pray for you before you leave. I want to pray for you.
somebody in this room has been given a pill too hard to swallow. Dude, it doesn't matter what the market does. We got Jesus. He holds the market in his hand. It doesn't matter who the next president is. We got Jesus. He knows who's going to be in that office. And if you're like me, it doesn't reach to my level anyway. I'm on the bottom of the food chain. But God is still God, isn't he? It doesn't matter. Dude. He can make a way out of no way. He can turn your darkness into day. He can be your joy in a time of sorrow. He can be your hope for your tomorrow. He's here on this Sunday morning just waiting to be there for you. All you got to do is reach out to him. And I got to give you a chance to do that before we go. So let's pray. Jesus, I pray for every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl. God, I pray for that dad this morning who's struggling. I pray for that young person who keeps turning to stuff instead of turning to you. God, I pray, God, for that mom who literally at night goes, what am I going to do? Who woke up this morning, even driving here, I pray for that couple who couldn't get along on a short drive to church. I pray, God, that somehow you would speak to him. Speak to the father of that family. Speak to the son in that family. Speak to the daughter who's made mistakes and she wonders if anybody would love her if they really found out who she was. I'm telling you, God, speak to that kid who wants to give up even on life. With every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. Dad, I'm going to challenge you right now, no matter what's happening in your family. If you buy your wife in a moment, I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask people to raise their hand who've been given a pill too hard to swallow, who've been dealt a severe blow. And I'm going to challenge you, Dad, to grab your wife by the hand, and you just raise hers and yours. In a moment, I'm going to ask young people, adults, moms, dad, brothers, sisters, boyfriend, girlfriend, it doesn't matter who you are, you've been given a pill too hard to swallow. You've been dealt a severe blow. There's a son who loves his mama, and you love her with all your heart. Dude, you need to let your mama know that it's going to be okay. Dude, she's wept over you. She's prayed over you. Even at night, sometimes you hear her crying out your name like I used to hear my mama cry mine out. See, my mama didn't give me her blood, but she gave me her heart. And moms, weep for your children, for the Bible says it would not be in vain. Even if they're not here, there's mamas in this room who thought if my son could just hurt Reggie, he should have, oh, if I could have just had my son here, listen to me. He's going to give you the hope for your entire family. But dad, I need you to do this. Brothers, I need you to do this. So right now, if you're in this room, you say, Reggie, I've been given a pill too hard to swallow. I've been dealt a severe blow. I don't know what to do. And all I want you to do on the count of three is just raise your hand. Husband, just grab your wife and just raise your hand with her. If you're by yourself, if you're a college student and it's rough and you don't know how to pay the bill, just raise your hand. If you're struggling with life issues and you want to give up, just raise your hand. On the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Go. Go, 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 go. Leave it up. Leave your hand up. Leave your hand up. Leave your hand up. It's amazing. Just leave it up. There's a lot of people with their hands up, but you know what's cool? There's some people who don't have their hand up. And I know there's prayer team people, and there's there's, uh, small group leaders, and there's pastors here. But there's just people who love God in this room. So now when I count to three, I want everybody who loves God, you're going to look up and you're going to see somebody near you with their hand up. And what I want you to do as fast as you can is just put your hand on their shoulder. Put your hand on their back. If they're good friends, just put your arms around them. You don't have to say a word. I'm going to do the praying. But I love it when people pray for people because God loves it. And he made us to help each other, to help each other along this merry way. You've been given a pill too hard to swallow. You've been dealt a severe blow. We can stand with you here. We're on your side and we're going to make it together. So you ready, church? On three, look up. And and even if you have your hand up and everybody in your row has your hand up, then just put your other hand around somebody. And we're going to agree together. You ready? One, two, three. Go, 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 go. Look up and move. Put your hands on somebody. Touch. You may not know them. Just say, hey, my name is Fred, and I'm going to lay my hands on you. Just do it now. Come on, do it. I'm going to pray. Jesus, I believe. I know. I know, God. You brought me here this weekend. And God, you know the pill. God, you know the sorrow that he knows. God, I pray that he would be a man of God. God, I pray that he would see more young people come to Christ than I ever dreamed of. God, I pray that millions would find hope because of him. God, I pray, God, that you would touch his mom. God, that she would have a peace that passes all understanding. God, I pray, God, that you would speak to the hurt. Speak to the sorrow in this room. 
And in the name of Jesus, I speak to suicide that it would be gone in the name of Jesus. Speak life in this church. Speak life in that teenage girl in this room. Speak hope. Pastor's going to come and give a few things, but at the end of the service, there's going to be a lot of people standing up front. And they're going to say, come and let us pray for you. Everyone who raised their hand, please let us pray for you. Never give up, man. Never give up. Because he loves you more than you'll ever dream.